when we saw that it was a white conical structure, we thought we should give it a name that connects the local people, connects technology with tradition. So that's when we called it ICE Stupa. Hello, I'm Sue Nelson and welcome to the Create the Future podcast brought to you by the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, celebrating engineering visionaries and inspiring creative minds. Aim high is a great piece of advice for any career, but in Sanam Wangchuk's case, it's especially apt because he's an engineer in one of the highest regions of the world. Sanam works in Ladakh, a Himalayan desert in Kashmir, where he also grew up. Despite not starting school until he was nine, he became a mechanical engineer and is now a founding president of the Himalayan Institute of Alternatives. And in 2014, he set up the Ice Stupa project. The word stupa is usually associated with Buddhist shrines, but thanks to Sonam and the power of social media, people around the world now know it also refers to incredible multi-storey high creations of ice that can help provide water to isolated communities throughout the year. Ice stupas are a form of artificial glaciers or baby glaciers, man-made, which uh, hope to resolve at least some part of the water problems where I am, Ladakh. It's the northernmost part of India across the Himalayas, in the Trans-Himalayas, which is facing acutely the effects of climate change. We seem to be in the forefront as our glaciers melt away, which are our mainstay for water. We are having to resort to solutions like the ice stupa. So what does it look like then? It, it, it's the stupa then, apart from this lovely sort of enlightenment cultural connection, is it more to do with the shape of this ice structure? Just to tell you, stupas are large conical monuments, mostly white in colour. So when we were working on finding solutions to water problems, the freezing of winter water into ice or making our own glaciers is not, say, an idea that I suddenly had. As a child, I grew up listening to stories or folklores from our grandparents about some technique that our ancestors used to make glaciers in the mountains. But it was somewhat mythological and very little scientific. And it would involve something like bringing a mother ice and a father ice and expecting a baby glacier. Sounds a bit funny, but the fact that they have been many hundreds of years and in many parts of the greater Himalayas or Ladakh, it's still practiced. So there must be something that works. So I grew up listening to these stories and then thought about how we could solve it more scientifically in today's times. And that's how we started pondering on freezing the water that goes waste in winters in our villages into ice that could stay frozen till summertime. Now, that is not easy. No, particularly you're going through spring when traditionally that's a, a season where things warm up and melt. Exactly. So people would laugh and say, by March, all the ice and snow on the ground is gone. How will you keep your ice from January till May when you need water? So it was a challenge for us. Then suddenly one day, I saw a frozen chunk of ice under a bridge near our school. And this was the month of May, mid-May. So that convinced me that ice can stay, provided that the right conditions are there. And the right conditions were under the bridge. Temperatures were same under the bridge. It was spring too. But what was different was there was no direct sunlight falling on the ice. Then I understood we have to cut the sun to keep it till May or June. Now then came the question, how would you have a shade? You can't have a giant bridge for a giant water reservoir, nor could you do like the Swiss, uh, you know, have uh, 
flannel or fleece covering your eyes that would be not practical so since we are at a school which aims to put uh, what is in the school books into practice to our rescue came high school or middle school geometry which says that certain shapes like spheres and hemispheres and cones have low surface area for the given volume and i could understand that the sun needs surface area to act on the eyes whereas farmers don't care about surface area they need volume so this was perfect high volume low surface area so we said we should make our eyes in the shape of a cone or a pyramid but when we did make a giant ice cone a it looked very much like a stupa b our hypothesis we were wondering whether it will work and at our school people were betting you know how long this ice cone work it was one story or two stories tall and uh, some of us said april others said uh, you know march and i was the most daring to say by may it did last till mid may later when we did piloting they went to six stories tall and much later other people made 12 stories tall which is 120 feet or some 40 meters so they can be quite big and hold 10 million liters of water which slowly melts and comes down useful in early summer when farmers need water the most that's brilliant it's so simple isn't it and and yet amazingly effective what's the framework for these structures when we saw that it was a white conical structure we thought we should give it a name that connects the local people connects technology with tradition so that's when we called it stupa and uh, now coming to the form and the structure the form is not very difficult it almost makes itself you know if you have a dripping water from the eaves of your roof in cold countries you will see conical thing either upright or inverted if it is icicles so they do make a cone almost naturally it's almost like 3d printing now the more important question is how do you raise water 10 stories tall in the mountains where we don't have a power supply we don't have any machines nor did we want to use because we wanted it to be available for farmers who don't have any of these technologies or the money to buy them so what is interesting is that we saw that we may not have pumps and power but we have gravity you know mountains people by definition have gravity because there is always an uphill and a downhill that's what a mountain is so similarly for the streams there is always an upstream and a downstream again how to make water rise tens of stories to our help came middle school science yeah physics maybe which says that water always maintains its level that's why masons use a water pipe to check their levels because water always maintains its level in a pipe so the beautiful thing i think about it is that we just put a pipe upstream and bring the pipe downstream to a desert where we need water and by this theory water always maintains its level there's pressure in the pipe for the water to go up to the inlet level at the outlet also and that's the power we use to power a fountain which sprays water into the sky into the minus 20 air of uh, ladakhi winters and that takes away the heat of the water uh, which is still liquid but it is at critical stage where just a little loss of heat makes it go solid that's phase change it's called latent heat if you remember you are you know middle school science so when the latent heat is taken by the minus 20 air around the water falls down and freezes and it naturally takes a takes the shape of a cone which as i said has low surface area and high volume that's how the structure goes it's amazing now I, i've looked at a few of these online and they're sort of almost like 
beautiful frozen Christmas trees, which then gradually melt and then the water can then be used for, I'm assuming, not just drinking, but for irrigation, as you mentioned. What's the status of the project at the moment? How many of these structures have you got involved in and, and started? At the moment, we are doing many, but the technology is still a bit rough because, uh, you know, we have not been able to refine and fine tune the fountains and the valves. And therefore, it requires engagement of people a bit. And in the winter, it's a little difficult. So therefore, we make it fun by inviting young people to participate in a competition called Ice Tupa Competition. So it becomes like an adventure sport for them in winters when they have little to do otherwise. So that's how we make them. But as for how many, we normally make in some uh, 25 to 30 villages where people, mostly young people, starting with the winter, get working on uh, building these ice stupas. That's great. And did you get any funding for it? So first we conceived the idea and prototyped at our school and we saw that it looked very much like a stupa so we called it an ice stupa but that was part of a kind of branding engineering because engineering is not just about materials and pumps and pipes it's also about how to connect to people so that it doesn't remain just a scientists or engineers love So we positioned it as stupas, ice stupas, and we brought, uh, we invited a spiritual leader who was also an environmental champion, His Holiness Chetang Rinpoche, to bless it. And with that, positioning and branding happened, and His Holiness fully supported this idea of water solutions and the name stupas. And then we said to pilot it further, we need support and funding. Again, we rather than going to a rich person or a big company, we said we'll crowdfund uh, the making of these stupas because that's how stupas were made in the ancient times. Everybody would pitch in a labor or resources. So we thought in 21st century, crowdfunding came closest to that. So with the blessing of the High Lama, the you know abbot in Tibetan Buddhism, and technology, we made pitching videos and internet was used to the most, even in these mountains. And we ran an international crowdfunding campaign from a US site. And that uh, drew a lot of interest from people around the world. So it was really like, whole world coming together to build these stupas, which used to be built to stop calamities from coming. So in this case, it was like to um, check climate change effects like glaciers melting, water shortage, and therefore we did it that way. And uh, it worked the way we thought that from the crowdfunding publicity, various companies and individuals got interested and Today, there are various companies that do their CSR around it. And I myself, from the talks and events that I do, contribute a big chunk to the Ice Tupa project, whereby we keep on one hand, uh, you know, pipes and materials. On the other hand, prize monies for these uh, youth organizations who participate in the competition and make bigger and bigger ice tupas. We were talking about the sort of framework earlier on and you were saying about, you know, how you pump pipe down the water, you've got the pressure of gravity, you create a fountain and then you get these stupas. I've seen some which look like they're on trees. They look like they're on Christmas trees or branches. So is that another way of making a stupa as well? Yes, that's the early part of making the stupas. Uh, You know, when you are starting the stupa, there's nothing to hold the water and it goes into the ground, which is warmer. So to kickstart the ice formation, we use bushes. This is what you perhaps saw. We use bushes, twigs, branches and nets. So what that does is it gives a holding surface for the 
fountain water as it drops and it slows down the flow of the water which means that it is exposed to the cold and therefore freezes and that's what makes it look like beautiful Christmas trees in ice and an art installation in some ways. But as that progresses, the ice itself gives enough surface area that the drops freeze while skidding on the earlier formed ice. So this is what makes it look beautiful. Now, you're from Ladakh. What is it like? You mentioned about the air temperature there being minus 21 or minus 23 at some point. Describe Ladakh for me in terms of the the landscape. You've heard of the Tibetan plateau as the roof of the world. So we are at the beginning of the Tibetan plateaus. As you come from tropical flatlands of India, to get to the roof, you have to have a rise. And that's like the steps, the staircase to the roof. And that's what the Himalayas are, like Himachal Pradesh and Bhutan, Sikkim. They're all the Himalayas. We are across, or the trans Himalayas, where it is a flat land. And because there's these mighty Himalayas, it becomes rain shadow. It stops even monsoon clouds from crossing. So we are completely barren desert. It, from my window, it looks more like Mars or Moon. So unlike the lush green Himalayas, we are high altitude mountain desert across the Himalayas. And temperatures swing between plus 35 in summers to minus 35 in winters. In other words, we are as close as it can get to outer space while still being on planet Earth. I was just thinking exactly that. They're the the sort of temperature ranges I hear about on planets. That's really interesting. And you mentioned that, you know, climate change in terms of affecting the uh, glaciers. How is climate change affecting this region that you live in then? We, in the high mountains, along with those on the coastal areas, are the first victims or frontiers of climate change. So in my region, we see untimely weather patterns. It doesn't snow much when it should snow and it pours when it shouldn't. And uh, our glaciers are receding very fast. So these are our lifelines based on which we settled here, our ancestors. So the glaciers are smaller and therefore they there is a acute shortage of water in early spring when plants need the most water and then in july august there is actually floods so we are facing alternatingly drought and flash floods and both of these cause a lot of damage flash floods in 2010 killed nearly a thousand people and washed away a lot of farms and houses The drought makes it difficult for people to live. And um, there are instances of villages that have had to abandon, like climate refugees. So all these things are starting to happen. And that is why we are working on these issues. And you were at school there. How did you come out of school deciding you wanted to become a mechanical engineer. What was it during your education, do you think, that led you towards this career? So as a child, I was always very curious about phenomena in nature. And I didn't have a school to go. So it was actually in a way better because I could develop my own curiosity-based learning. Uh, Later, I did go to school at nine years of age and developed a lot of interest in science and use of it to solve problems. So basically, I was and wanted to become a problem solver and science and engineering was just a means as other things like communication tools to make people aware and so on. So I decided to study mechanical engineering while chasing for solutions to cold climate in Ladakh. So to be precise, I was fascinated in my 11th grade schooling by lenses and mirrors, concave mirrors and convex 
mirrors and lenses and I started thinking of how this could be used in Ladakh to grow vegetables underground in winters. And then I started looking up what can help me learn more about such things. And an uncle of mine said mechanical engineering is the field. So the decision was made and a year later I was in an engineering college. And obviously it's been something that's changed your life ever since in terms of your work. And you also co-founded, after you'd studied um, your mechanical engineering degree at the National Institute of Technology, Srinagar, you founded the Students' Educational and Cultural Movement of Ladakh. And and that has some incredibly interesting buildings. Tell me a little bit about some of the the buildings and, and why they've gained so much interest and awards. First of all, when I was doing my engineering, I had to teach students to finance my engineering. But while teaching students, I came across how pathetic the education system was. So I decided to work rather in the field of education and liberate these, uh, you know, suffering souls. So while doing that in Ladakh, I came back to Ladakh after engineering, unlike my friends who would go to Bangalore or Silicon Valley. Now, while reforming the education system, I saw that one of the problems was the buildings, the school buildings themselves. You know, it's minus 30 outside, minus 10 inside. Your fingers are frozen. You can't even write exams. And there was huge failure in the system among Ladakhi children. So I started, among other things, among many other things, I started resolving the issue of school buildings, cold freezing school buildings that was a good opportunity to put my engineering, mechanical engineering into use. Uh, But again, we neither had the money nor the technology to have centrally heated buildings and so on. So I looked around and saw what we have. And my love anyway was for, if you remember, sun and its rays, uh, optics, lenses, mirrors. So I saw that in Ladakh, we don't have much of other things, but we have plenty of sunshine. 300 days or more in a year are sunny. That was enough to make the winters warm. And on the other hand, to build the buildings, the school buildings, again, we couldn't afford fancy materials, but we had plenty of earth or mud right under our feet. So I thought, why not bring the two together? Mud under your feet and sun over your head, which are abundant and free for everyone, rich and poor. So that's when we started building earth buildings, which our ancestors used to. All buildings in Ladakh used to be earth, so nothing new there. But what we did is blend it with modern science of thermodynamics or heat science and um, use those principles to build buildings that stay at around plus 18 when it is minus 20 outside without any heating except for the sun. And this was a great relief for the students who could now happily study in the warmth of these solar heated mud buildings. And they're affordable. So not just our school, but other people could build also. So this is how the solar passive mud building uh, movement started. Of course, it has gone a long way now. That sounds great. And it also sounds it totally reflects your ethics of you've put your community first over Silicon Valley. You've used your knowledge to make things better for the people you grew up with. You've isolated a problem, in this case, education, because you yourself didn't start school until you were nine and realise this has got to change. Do you feel that this is how engineers can really make a difference, particularly when they're local. Definitely. You know, two things. Engineers, I think, are basically problem solvers. So an engineer must be solving problems. Otherwise, they are not really engineers. And local people best understand their challenges and the root causes of them. So they are best placed to solve problems. But if you are a local and an engineer, then it is a responsibility you have on your shoulders 
to solve these problems. So when I came to Ladakh 30 years ago after my education, engineering education, you know, there was a trend which still continues that every winter people find it very cold and those who can afford leave Ladakh and go to warmer places like Mumbai or Goa. I pledge to myself that I will stay put in Ladakh every winter and that's the only way I'll understand the problems and that's the only way I can find solutions. So non-local people will have a hard time finding solutions. Even local people will have a hard time if they don't face the problem and stay put. So I decided I should come what may. Any other season, I don't care. But winters, I must spend in Ladakh. So that's how I started. And I started understanding the problems and then finding solutions and finding solutions that are affordable and replicable for all. And that's how these solar heated mud buildings came up. Now I'm happy today the government is following these and we are able to possibly make a whole of Ladakh by and large carbon neutral because most of the pollution and emissions in this region, I think 80 to 90 percent of energy use is in heating houses because it's so cold here. Um, And what about future plans? What are you working on at the moment? I am part of uh, this alternative university called Himalayan Institute of Alternatives. The main aim of this, Hayal, is to do research and development to find solutions for the mountains, which are like um, left out by the world. You know, there's very little happening for the mountains and definitely by the mountain people. So this institute finds these solutions in an institutional way. And the idea of this alternative institute is that it will raise its own resources to run the university by having an enterprise arm where the students and faculty actually put into practice what they study and research so that students get hands-on experience. It's not a textbook knowledge that they can't use, but they actually work on live projects, live laboratories and which actually generate income, revenues. And the revenues run the university, so it becomes affordable education for everyone. This would be maybe the first university where you don't have to pay huge fees. You might actually be paid by the university for learning and doing. And learning happens mostly when there's doing. That sounds great. And I I, I must admit to taking a peek at your YouTube channel, over 1.3, I think, million subscribers on that. I watched one you did on Ley Airport and you were quite outspoken about its sort of climate and environmental credentials because it's currently being constructed in, and you called its um, construction a joke. And then you explained why, because you said the angle of the roof for solar heating wasn't quite right. But as a result of that video, something happened, didn't it, a few days later? Yes, yes. So there's this big airport coming in Leh, but somehow it's completely opposite of what would be a sustainable carbon neutral airport. It doesn't use even the sun that we have plenty of and is aims to use diesel boilers. So I appeal to them to change and when not much happened, I appeal to the Indian Prime Minister to say that you have declared that India will be carbon neutral by 2070 and that Ladakh will be carbon neutral and um, brought it to the notice of the prime minister. And yes, thanks to social media and a very responsive government, within a few weeks, uh, the prime minister's office sent a team to look at it and they asked us to provide our solution. And just two days ago, the top brass of Indian Aviation Ministry came here, flew here just for three hours, and they assured us that they'll do everything to make it an example for the world as a carbon neutral airport. So yes, I'm happy that social media and the people who watch and support makes governments take notice, and especially when the government is environmentally oriented, things can change. And this airport, thanks to these events, might change from a completely brown airport to a green airport. 
That's great. And it's so nice to hear social media being used as a force for for change for good instead of often the more negative aspects that are associated with social media. What made you start a YouTube channel in the first place? Was it specifically to highlight your engineering? So, yeah, I've always believed in learning, researching, implementing and sharing, you know, with the people. If you don't have the people with you, it's not much use to be a scientist shut up in a laboratory. So the social media handles give you that organ to reach out to the people. And uh, thanks to that, as I said, when we called it Ice Stupas, uh, whole of Ladakh and the world could identify and could feel for it and could support it. Similarly, when we did our solar heated uh, buildings, people could relate to it. People wanted to learn about it. And our alternative university was there to give them that skill. So it all works uh, in tandem in a beautiful blend. So those ice stupas sort of brought the attention because they are so visually stunning and different. Do you get inspiration from others and other engineers on social media that inspire you or do you tend to look for at nature itself to supply those answers? Both. I do draw inspiration from the work we do in with nature and the people around us. Yes, social media does give us a lot of inspiring things. For example, this whole electric vehicle movement, which will cut down pollution. I get inspiration. But the same people, when they talk about going to Mars, leaving the Earth, I get another kind of inspiration to work harder on making planet Earth better rather than trashing it as a use and throw thing and going to Mars to trash it. So I draw my inspiration to uh, do the opposite, make Earth as beautiful as possible for the people and take that as a challenge rather than leaving Earth. That's absolutely inspiring. Sanam Wang Chuk, thank you very much for joining me on the Create the Future podcast. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Find out more about the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering by following QE Prize on Twitter and Instagram or by visiting qeprize.org, where on February the 1st, the winner of the 2022 Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering will be announced live at 12 noon GMT. Thanks for listening and do join me again next time. Thank you.